All righty, folks, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we gave a minute or so to get everybody a uh, chance to get logged in. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, I am uh, John Brennan. I am the uh, Vice President of Appraisal Issues with the Appraisal Foundation. Um, we are here to talk about the first exposure draft of practical applications of real estate appraisal and uh, hopefully be able to share some information and, and, and spend some time answering some questions for you. Uh, I'm joined today by Mark Lewis, who is the chair of the Appraiser Qualifications Board. Welcome, Mark. Uh, howdy, y'all. We, uh, we wish you a happy Friday the 13th and hope that we don't run into uh, any difficulties here. Uh, we also have Magdalene Vasquez, who is working behind the scenes and, and uh, will be uh, helping us out with today's uh, presentation. So with that, let's go ahead and get started uh, on the presentation itself. The, um, the first thing we want to we talk about the introductions and the first thing we want to do is a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, move on. And that is uh, to let you know that this <coughs> is being recorded and it will be uh, on our, posted on our website as well as our YouTube channel. If, uh, if you or any of your uh, uh, friends and colleagues wish to view it at a later date. Um, at the conclusion of the webinar today, we're going to there's going to be a brief survey you will receive, and, and we know everybody loves to receive surveys, but uh, it's just very brief, and we would really appreciate you just taking a minute or two to fill that out. We want to make these webinars as meaningful and as relevant and, and helpful as possible, and your feedback will be uh, very much appreciated. As, um, as we said earlier, we will attempt to answer questions today, uh, time permitting, at the end of, towards the end of the webinar. And the way to do that is by using the chat feature uh, on the Zoom software that you are, uh, that you are viewing this on. Uh, you can scroll down to the bottom of your, of your screen and a menu should appear that shows the chat feature. Alternatively, an easy way to uh, open up the chat dialog box is by the Alt H shortcut on your keyboard. Alt H will also bring up that chat feature. And so you'll, you'll want to use that not only for uh, to be able to ask any questions, but you will also get uh, important information to in, on today's webinar in that chat box. For example, you will see a link to the exposure draft page on the Appraisal Foundation's website where you can download the exposure draft that we are talking about today. Uh, Magdalene will have that uh, placed into the chat box. In addition, there will be a PDF of the, uh, of the PowerPoint presentation that we're going through today. You'll be able to, um, to do those links. And I see now that, that Magdalene has done both of those. So uh, those are available in the chat box if you have not already done so. So with that, let's get into the meat of the uh, presentation today. And, and again, we're talking about the practical applications of real estate appraisal. And if you're not familiar with this concept uh, in, in its, its most simple terms, we're talking about simulated training. And uh, Mark, uh, I, I, would, I would ask you, uh, this, is, this is nothing new, is it? No, John, uh, virtual training has been around for a very long time. It's not a new concept at all. It's been used in various uh, professions and, and trades. Uh, we see everything from bartenders to ice cream scoopers to forklift operators, uh, truck drivers. They all use simulated training, but uh, not only for, for individuals such as those, but professions that, that are more recognizable, such as surgeons and nursing, uh, dentists, accountants, astronauts, firefighters, all of those professions use some type of virtual training. So it's been used successfully for a lot of professions over the years. And uh, so we are exploring the options of seeing if it worked for, uh, for appraisers. Yeah, very good. And, and a lot of people say, well, why? Well, you know, you can't, for firefighters, you can't train them by going around burning down all the buildings in the city to learn how to do that. You can't teach surgeons just getting people off the street to, uh, to do voluntary surgery uh, for that training. So it is very important, and as you say, it has become uh, very state-of-the-art with today's technology. So with that, let's talk about um, some of the general information that's, that's in the exposure draft. We'll start with section one, um, and that, I guess, is as simple as, Perea, what is it, Mark? 
Well, we, we've all kind of gotten a, a good chuckle out of the uh, acronym PERIA and uh, what, it, what it might sound like, but essentially PERIA is Practical Applications of Real Estate Appraisal, and it is simply an alternative method of gaining real estate appraisal experience using simulated training. Uh, the actual goal is to emulate actual appraisal experience. The uh, existing model that we have for obtaining experience in the appraisal profession today requires a beginning appraiser to link up with a supervising or a sponsoring appraiser and begin some type of apprenticeship with that uh, sponsoring appraisal, appraiser. Uh, this model works great when there's an adequate supply of qualified and win willing professionals who will take the time and effort to serve as that supervisor and appraiser to a beginning trainee. AQB does not discount this type of apprenticeship model at all. However, as we will discuss a little more in detail, the existing model that we have today is just not working well in all markets. Uh, the Perea model simply provides for an alternative method of gaining real estate appraisal experience. Uh, appraisal experience, as we all know, it, it begins with the basics. The Perea model, which is being exposed, starts with the concept that a supervisor in the existing model would uh, communicate to a trainee on day one. So that information we are trying to emulate. So the model being proposed would start with the very basics and then progress logically through the appraisal process. Great, Mark, and something I, I want to just underscore here to make sure uh, all of uh, all of today's viewers uh, understand is you said this is an alternative. We are not replacing the current uh, apprenticeship or supervisor trainee model. This is simply an alternative because there are places where that model does still work, and we certainly won't, wouldn't want to preclude people from becoming appraisers um, just because uh, if they're able to use that model. So. So this kind of is, is a good uh, uh, basic starting point of what Perea is. Why don't we talk about what it's not? Sure. Uh, Perea is not intended to be another level of qualifying education, or nor is it considered to be classroom training. Uh, and there has been some discussion that uh, Perea is simply a, a capstone uh, type program. And the, the capstone program, I, I do want to address, a, a capstone class uh, takes a single subject property and then given a set of market information, uh, requires the student to produce an appraisal. Now, in and of itself, this is a terrific program for which I highly recommend. However, a capstone type course involves a single set of parameters and a single appraisal. What we is being proposed today in the in the Perea model uh, would have multiple appraisal situations involving various market conditions, requiring appraisal decisions to be made all along the process and then executed. So we do not consider this to be a capstone program at all. And and you're going to hear this uh, a couple of times throughout this webinar that that um, the capstone, as good as it is, talks about a single property. Uh, whereas Perea, we're going to talk about not only a whole variety of different types of properties, but types of different assignments, types of different market conditions. Uh, and, and you'll hear, uh, as Mark will tell you here shortly, this is a, intended to be a very broad-based and, and, and more comprehensive training on markets and properties that, uh, that may not be available to a single practitioner. So, Mark, you talked about, you, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but Let's talk a little bit about why um, Perea is something the board is, is proposing. Sure. Uh, we have, as AQB, we have heard over the years and, and uh, are well aware of trainees who have perhaps gone through all their qualifying education and, and are ready to start their, their experience portion of their, their process and they have called every appraiser in their area and all appraisers uh, have said no to being a supervisor. 
And, you know, at this point in time, that, that, that hamstrings the, the trainee from progressing forward. Right now, the, the process for uh, an appraiser moving forward through, through the credentialing process requires the cooperation of a supervisor. And, you know, for, for one reason or another, qualified supervisors uh, have been limited in some markets. Uh, and that could be for the time and expense required to be a supervisor. And it does take a lot of time and it is an expensive ordeal for a supervisor to, to provide that training. Then there's the, the concept that we've heard that, you know, as a supervisor, I'm just training my competition. Or the, the issue that we've heard from, from many, uh, especially in the, the regulating uh, arena, is that the training is limited only to that supervisor's practice. And so they, the, the training appraiser only is exposed to whatever the supervisor is doing. Uh, we are proposing in this exposure draft that Perea may be able to provide a more broad-based and consistent training across the board. And so because we are going to be able, or we think we're, we're going to be able to, to change situations and change uh, context of which an appraisal uh, has to be analyzed, that we can actually perhaps improve upon the, the existing model. And well, right now, there's a kind of a three-legged stool that a trainee has to go through to obtain a credential. They have to obtain their, their qualifying education, and a trainee can apply themselves and actually earn that, that qualifying education without any other cooperation. The trainee can study hard. They can pass the, the national exam, which is very challenging. They can do that. However, in order to progress through the experience leg of that stool, it does require under the current system, the cooperation of a supervisor. And that is kind of outside the hands of the trainee in many cases. So uh, we are attempting to re remove or trying to find an alternative to that issue. And so we're trying to remove those unnecessary barriers to becoming an, an appraiser. We are thinking that if we, if the exposure draft is actually adopted uh, eventually, that uh, if individuals may actually uh, become more marketable to a, uh, an appraisal firm after completing the, the Perea training. So we may think this, think this could be a, a good thing to actually produce a more marketable appraiser. Great, Mark. And you know, we, you, we talked earlier how Berea is not intended to replace the current um, trainee mentorship model, but we talked about uh, it, it being an alternative. And, and when we talk about some of these advantages, you know, one of the things here on the slide is, is the training limited to the supervisor's practice. I mean, it, the truth is you can have the very best supervisor in the world who is willing to take on trainees, but what that trainee will learn is what that supervisor does and the market that that supervisor practices in. It may not be that type of broad-based training that we're talking about uh, that could be available under Perea. So uh, Mark, you wanna, you wanna elaborate on that at all? Yeah, maybe I'll provide a little color behind that. Uh, let's just say that I'm the supervisor and I have taken on a trainee that trainee is going to learn how to appraise residential property in a rural market context. So uh, Lufkin, where I'm from, is a town of about 35,000, and we are the biggest town around. So that is the context of which is all the training is going to happen if you are a trainee under, under my sponsorship. What you will not find, uh, because we don't have condominiums, in, in my part of the, of, of the country. Uh, you don't have cooperatives. Those urban type properties, uh, row houses, uh, we don't have that. So you don't get that kind of, of exposure if you're uh, under my supervision as a, as a supervisory appraiser. So even 
the best of, of supervisors are limited in their scope of practice. So we are anticipating that Perea could provide a more broad-based uh, experience for the participant that would show a very wide variety of property types. Great, great. Now I know some of the people that are that are uh, watching today think this this is brand new, uh, and again, it hasn't been adopted. But um, the th this concept actually started before uh, July of 2015, but in earnest with a concept paper in July of 2015. So, Mark, you want to walk us through what's been done and what's coming? Yes, this has been talked about for for a, a very long time. Uh, the kind of public information that we put out began in around the middle part of, of 2015 with just a concept paper. And then we progressed to a, discussed it in a public hearing in, in 2016. Uh, we, we took a step back and discussed it further uh, and allowed for comments to come in. In March of 19, we, we released a discussion draft, which took it to another level. Uh, and then in May of 2019, we actually, at one of our, our public hearings, we actually demonstrated a, a virtual reality uh, of, of what maybe the potential of a Perea program could do. And then, of course, in September, uh, the first part of this month, we released this exposure draft. Uh, this is our first exposure draft, for which we're looking for for feedback uh, from you who are tuning into this program and certainly anybody who's reading it. Uh, then in November, November the 1st of this year, we're gonna have a public meeting in St. Petersburg, Florida. That'll begin at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And I would encourage you to register and attend that, that meeting in person. We'd love to see you. But if you're not able to make the meeting and travel uh, to St. Petersburg, that meeting will be live streamed. And I think you can go to the events page on the Appraisal Foundation's website, register for that event, and they will send you a link to join us uh, via live stream. So we would love to see you, and we would certainly love to, to uh, hear your, your feedback. That's great, Mark. And, I, and I'd point out, too, that uh, for anybody that's interested, that these prior documents that we received public comment on, they are available if you want to go back to our website and, and look at uh, prior exposure drafts. Um, there is also, uh, the Magdalene has put in the chat box links to not only the virtual reality uh, demo that Mark talked about uh, on our YouTube page, but also links to be able to um, register for the, lot, for the meeting, either in the, in the November 1st meeting, either in person or via live stream. So Magdalene, thanks for getting those together. Let's talk about more detail about really what, what it is that these proposals are about, Mark. Under the, uh, the current uh, exposure draft that we're, we're taking a look at and looking for feedback, uh, there are two module, modules, including in, in that exposure draft. There's a module for the LR credential and then a second module for the CR credential. Uh, again, this is intended to be simulated training and with using various types of delivery uh, methods from computer-based learning to video gaming, video tutorials, uh, virtual assistance, virtual reality, uh, whatever methodology works, uh, but it is simulated training. Now, how, how are we gonna deliver this? The, uh, the proposal right now is for a AQB to develop the, the rules related to a PREA program, but it's, it's kind of difficult to evaluate what a PREA program would, would actually look like without a sample. So what the Appraisal Foundation is, is, is deliberating is to produce an actual model program which could be utilized by providers. Uh, however, if a provider wanted to develop a similar experience uh, model, that model would, would uh, need to be approved by AQB based on the criteria requirements that we are exposing today. 
and then following the a sample that that perhaps the appraisal foundation would would produce great and uh and and as you said that uh, this is all to be determined um and and there's there's a uh, a bifurcation here between what the appraiser qualifications board may adopt for a program and then the actual creations of the program as as mark has alluded to so let's talk a little bit more about um section two of the exposure draft and talk about what the AQB is proposing as far as maximum allowable experience? Well, we got a lot of feedback uh, from our concept paper and our discussion back requiring uh, or regarding how much uh, experience could actually be obtained through this type of program. The feedback ranged from uh, this will never work, you've got to have boots on the ground, that's the only way to get experience to uh, we need to have 100% of experience uh, gained this way. So what we are proposing is that uh, in the exposure draft is that a, a participant in a PREA program, whether uh, they are looking to, to obtain a LR credential or a CR credential, that they could obtain up to 100% of that experience through this model. Uh, now, no partial credit would be, would be granted. Right? That's what's proposed, is that uh, if you only, say, uh, participated in half of the LR model, the, you would get no credit. So you would have to actually complete the model in order to, to obtain uh, credit. But what needs to be understand is that states can be more restrictive. So even if this exposure draft is adopted and AQB says that you can obtain up to 100% of your experience through one of these models, the states can be more restrictive and they can limit that to something less or none at all. Uh, that is a complete state prerogative there. But under the LR model, uh, what is being proposed is that you could obtain uh, up to 100% of your experience for an LR. Now, if you are trying to obtain a, a certified residential credential and you only completed the LR module, the proposal is that you could, you could obtain 67% of your experience for the CR. Then uh, for CG, uh, if you remember, uh, for certified general, uh, there is a requirement of 3,000 hours of experience, of which uh, 1,500 has to be in non-residential, and 15, the other 1,500 can come from non-residential or residential. So the proposal is that if you complete the LR model and you are trying to obtain a certified general, that you could have up to 33% of your experience come from that towards your CG from that LR model. Same type of, of thought process for the CR. If you complete the CR model, then uh, you can have 100% of your experience for LR, 100% of your experience for the CR uh, credential. And again, for CG, if you complete the CR model, then you would be eligible for perhaps up to 50% of your experience toward your CG. But again, uh, the states would, would be required to establish what is that, that level, whether it's 100% or something less. Great, great. Mark, let's talk about what people would have to do before being able to sign up for uh, one of these modules. What are the prerequisites that are being proposed? Well, there is a prerequisite, and what is being proposed is that uh, uh, a prerequisite for enrolling in the LR model would be to complete all of the QE required to be a licensed residential appraiser, which means you're going to have to have 150 hours of qualifying education prior to enrolling in a, in a, a LR, an approved LR PREA program. And then following the same thing, if you are moving to a certified residential, the prerequisite would be all the QE required 
for a certified residential credential, which is 200 hours. The, uh, the thought process behind what we are proposing in requiring all QE to be completed before entering into the PREA program is that having a baseline education, what we think will make the experience gained in a PREA program more meaningful as now the trainee would be able to see how the concepts that are actually taught in a QE class are actually applied in a in appraisal situation. Great. We know in the uh, current uh, model of the apprentice uh, model that, that there are supervisory requirements. What, what are we talking about here for Berea in terms of quote unquote supervision? Well, what we are proposing uh, in, the, in the exposure draft is that there will be required interactions between the Berea mentor and the participant in the program. Uh, if you examine the outlines in the exposure draft, there are required stop points in there where the participant must meet with the mentor. Uh, of course, the mentor, uh, it is anticipated that the mentor be available to assist that participant throughout the process. But again, there would be required a minimal number of checkpoints there. Uh, AQB recognizes that likely some of the participants will require a minimal amount of interaction from their mentors, but others will require a, a substantial amount of interaction in order to complete the program. But the exposure draft is intended to set a minimal number of contact points with that mentor. It's also proposed that those mentors are going to need to meet the same minimum qualifications as the supervisory appraisers would in, a, in the current model, which means they need to be a certified appraiser and they need to be in good standing for a period of three years. Great, so there's some consistency there. Um, Mark, how is the AQB proposing that this type of experience would actually be verified and, and be able to use by the states? Well, this has been a, a topic of, of significant discussion of how, how to verify it. The, uh, the concept being exposed today is that a participant completing the, either the LR or the CR module would receive a certificate of completion uh, at the end of that program, certifying that that participant has completed the minimum requirements of the LR or the CR module. Uh, right now, what we are proposing is that there would be no logs required of that participant. Great. And uh, one of the next things we're going to talk about is, is uh, preparing USPAP compliant appraisal reports. And, and the AQB has made some proposals here that we'll talk about. But it's important to distinguish that we're not talking about that being the complete level of training in terms of the number of types of assignments they'll see, we're gonna be talking about the actual USPAP compliant appraisal reports. So Mark, what, what, is, what is the AQB proposing here? Well, the, uh, the proposal is that a participant would be required to, to actually complete a minimum of three USPAP compliant appraisal reports for each module. So uh, if the the participant actually completed both the LR module and the CR module, uh, they would be required to, to actually complete a minimum of six USPAP compliant appraisals. The uh, thought process is that when a, a, under the current system, when a trainee produces a log, the state picks uh, individual appraisals off of that log to actually review to confirm uh, that experience is there. And what we are proposing is that uh, a minimum of three reports uh, be produced as USPAP compliant appraisals for each module, and which is relatively consistent with what is uh, currently required in, in the states. And, and Mark, 
you know, the, one of the things that we've talked about here is that, is that this training really is, is intended to, to mirror the current type of model. And so there's really going to be a big focus on the development. Of course, the reporting follows, and, and we know that uh, we're talking about the residential appraisal world right now. And there are forms and the forms that change and they are evolving with uh, what the GSEs and such are doing. But the development is really the key here. So even though, again, as I mentioned a minute ago, somebody would have to do three USPAP compliant appraisal reports, we're talking about a heck of a lot more that they're going to be exposed to than just three assignments on the development side. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, you know, we, we'd like to to stress that AQB is deliberately placing more emphasis in the PREA modules on the appraisal process uh, as outlined in USPAP standard one than the reporting requirements in standard two. Uh, there will be sections in PREA that we anticipate, uh, for instance, uh, perhaps a, the, the highest and best use section of the appraisal process where the participant would be exposed to multiple highest and best use situations, which would require analysis and then application of the appraisal theory into a highest and best use decision. So the, the actual appraisal report coming together is, is just a, a symbolic uh, correlation of everything that has been uh, experienced in the module. Yeah, and, and we, for those people that do or have looked at that, that virtual reality demonstration that we referred to earlier that's available on our, on our YouTube channel, you'll see the power of Berea is really these, what are called randomizations. So, you know, you, you, you've got a situation that starts off as a fairly basic or elementary type exercise during Berea, and then you start compounding that with different factors that, that ultimately result in that level of broad-based training. For example, with a supervisor today, um, if they were to take a trainee and start training them, it may take it may take years before they find properties that have good examples of functional obsolescence and how to deal with that, or external obsolescence, or or uh, special changes in the marketplace due to a major employer um, folding up shop and things like that. These are all things that after somebody, somebody shows competence in the one level to, to be able to do that you can press a button and now they have to understand how to do this. So that's that broad based training that we're talking about. And that's why there's a lot more emphasis in the development than there is in the reporting. So, uh, thanks for that, Mark. Now the, the, Outlines, the content outlines, that's really kind of the meat of what the AQB is saying uh, needs to be in these programs. Can you talk about that for a minute? Sure, those, those content outlines that are they're in the criteria section of the exposure draft uh, generally follow guide note one, which is the, the suggested guide note for qualifying education. So it kind of gives, gives a parameter of, of how the, the, the PREA model would, would flow through. But uh, generally, the, the, the content outlines that are in the actual criteria part of the exposure draft would, would contain the what is required in the, the module. Great. So that's the what. That's the AQB saying. This is what you need to be trained on. So let's talk for a minute, uh, and you did allude to this earlier with, with some of the methods, um, but let's talk about how, how you're gonna say how you're going to do, perform that type of training. Yeah, we, under, we understand that the, the exposure draft is long. Uh, it takes a little while to get through, but in the, the back of the exposure draft, we have a, a proposal for a new guide note 11. The new guide note 11 is, uh, anticipated to be the guidance for how to deliver the PREA content. And again, we, we talked about various forms of, of learning that, that could go through an experience model uh, from computer-based learning to video gaming, video tutorial, virtual assistant, virtual reality, 
all those things are there. Uh, I understand as, as, as I'm getting older, this is not how, this is not how I learn, but it's certainly something that some of that, uh, a lot of our, our younger generations, they are very used to learning in this type of environment. And we think that it, it can be applied to the appraisal process. Uh, if you want to see a sample of what we're talking about for possibly one type of, of environment, then uh, you can go to our, our YouTube channel on, uh, at the Appraisal Foundation, and you can look at, uh, at John actually participating in a virtual reality situation. You see the picture on your screen with John in the corner with his... Uh, virtual reality glasses on, and he's actually measuring a house using uh, a laser pointer. Now, understand this is just one method that perhaps could be used in a training module such as this, but it does demonstrate the power of these type of training models. Yeah, that's great, Mark. And, that, and again, if you do go uh, look at that video, pay attention, particularly at the end, the randomization, because literally you push a button and you you have different types of houses. And so we start when we started in that uh, example that Mark's referring to with a basic uh, small single story house with a detached garage. And we did things like adding covered porches, at, making it an attached garage, having a small second story, having a large second story. And there you can see that is the real power of this simulated training. You can expose participants to things that they well, might take them a long time or never be able to see. And that, that's really the power there. So um, with that, um, that concludes our, 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 our presentation portion. Uh, we will be taking, uh, trying to address some questions here in just a moment. But it is, uh, uh, it's easy to get a hold of us. Uh, there is our contact information on the screen. We, uh, we are available to uh, answer questions and, and try to provide information to you. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and try to answer a couple of the questions. And uh, between Mark and I, hopefully be able to provide you with some answers. So uh, with that, uh, Mark, uh, I'll give you an easy one. The first question that, uh, that we've had come up here is, when will Korea be available? Uh, well, that's the uh, $64 million question. Uh, this is the first exposure draft of the Perea concept. Uh, while we hope that we got it right the first time, we certainly won't know until we get back feedback from the uh, appraisal community and those users of appraisals and the regulators <clears throat> to see what we have missed, perhaps. Uh, we're not naive enough to think that, that, uh, that we haven't missed something. So we're going to be looking at, uh, at feedback to see if we need to, to modify. Perhaps there needs to be a, a second or, or perhaps even a third exposure draft of this. But we will work through that process. Once we have the rules set in place, uh, then you know, we've got to get it implemented. And so it'll take some time. If the Appraisal Foundation elects to do that model, then, uh, then it'll take some time to actually develop that. So you know, at the best of situations, we may be looking at 2021 under the best of situations. Yeah, and, and I think it's important, you know, to, we understand th this concept has, as we mentioned earlier, kind of went from, um, well, we're not sure we're on board with this to a lot of people saying, how quickly can it, can it be made available? So um, to Mark's point about, you know, the Appraisal Foundation considering uh, possibly developing this this model program, um, we are doing some some background information on understanding what we need to understand to do that about the technical aspects of it, uh, talking with some consultants and, and such, uh, so that when the AQB does, uh, assuming the AQB does adopt the rules, as Mark just said, for Perea, that we can try to hit the ground running and look at uh, possibly developing that model program, not waiting until all that's done and then start that process. So uh, we understand that the people that are that that are supportive of this program will want to see it sooner rather than later, and uh, we will definitely uh, definitely do our best to to try to make that happen. But again, as Mark said, the board hasn't adopted Perea yet, and that that's something that 
is, you know, although that is the board's, uh, why the board has proposed what they have in the exposure draft, but it's, it's not a done deal at this point. Um, we've got a couple other questions. We've got one that we did address, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll repeat it here. Someone asked Mark uh, if they can get partial credit for Perea if they don't finish the entire module. Uh, the answer to that is, is what we are exposing is no. Uh, your partial credit would not be allowed. The reason for that is it's hard to, it's hard to judge how far that participant got in that model. Uh, so granting partial credit would be very difficult to do. So this is an all or nothing uh, proposal. So you either complete the LR uh, module and you get up to 100% LR experience, or you complete the CR model, you get 100, up to 100%. Uh, that's what's being proposed, so no, no partial credit. Great. There's a question that says, uh, what's the difference between supervisory appraisers and mentors? Um, and and one, of the, one of the things I want to stress here is, you know, a supervisory appraiser today is, is taking his or her practice and taking somebody under their wing and providing that training to them. You know, Perea is, it, is intended to be a program which someone would have a role in if they wish to be a mentor and they met the minimum qualifications where there might be multiple uh, participants in a Perea module and this person is acting as the mentor based on where that person is in the module. So it's not, the, there isn't a mentor tied to an individual uh, like they are with the supervisory appraiser and trainee today. It's more that they are there to guide them during their process and when they hit certain milestones, as, as Mark alluded to, uh, they would be there to to make sure that the participant has understood correctly what they have learned through the through the program, so it, it's a bit of a different uh, a different animal than the supervisor and the trainee. Uh, another question says, how can the trainee obtain local a, a geographic appraisal experience in his or her market? Well, uh, to me, that that we're really talking about geographic competency. And, uh, and Mark, I think this is an important distinction that the AQB has tried to make for a long time. And first of all, I would say that under today's model, nobody has to have local experience. When you apply to your state for a credential, there is no requirement that you've had to have experience in a certain city or a certain county or whatever. It's statewide. The geographic part really talks about competency and, and and Mark, hasn't the AQB really tried to draw a bright line between what somebody is as qualified versus competency, which comes later in practice under USPAP? No, that's correct. We've, we've tried to, to emphasize the point that we are uh, trying to uh, establish a, a minimum level for a qualified appraiser. Competence is earned over time. And so we're, we're talking about producing a, an appraiser who has a minimal level of, of competence generally. And then once they get into a specific market, they, will, they have USPAP requirements to obtain competency in that geographic market. That's a, that's a USPAP thing. Uh, AQB is, is concerned with producing that minimally qualified appraiser. So they have the qualifications necessary to become competent. Right, so if, in, 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 as an example, in my case, I'm in the state of California. If I got all my training in, uh, with a supervisor today in Los Angeles and I got credentialed by the state and I wanna go practice in San Francisco, I'm allowed to do that. I didn't have to have any experience in San Francisco. My experience was eligible because it met the minimum qualifications. But now when I go to San Francisco, I need to be competent, which includes that geographic competency. So um, we have another, we have a couple of questions that, re, that ask about why isn't Perea applying to the certified general classification and and I'll just start off and mark if you want to add to it please do but you know the the thought process here was hey this is all brand new let's get this under our belt 
Um, the AQB has talked about, you know, they need to walk before they run on this. Is it possible that at some point down the road, if the Perea uh, concept proves successful for residential, that the AQB may consider something for certified general? Well, sure, that's, uh, that would be a natural progression, uh, but it's, it's gonna be a long progression. Uh, we do want to try this and see if it works uh, for the residential. It seems to be from the feedback we get from the appraisal profession that the, the issues with the current model that's in place, the apprenticeship model, there is a, a very pronounced need for this in the residential sector. Uh, while there are parts of the country that, that uh, there is a need for, for CG also, it's less pronounced for CG. So we're starting with, with residential and uh, see if it works, see where we're right, see where, where we need to improve, and uh, then perhaps uh, follow later with a CG model. Great, thanks. We, we have um, another question that, that says, it, it, if, I'm, if I'm already a certified appraiser, would I be allowed to take Perea to kind of uh, act as a foundational uh, to make sure that, 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 that I see the kind of training that maybe I didn't see with a supervisor. And I would say that, um, that, that that's, that's a very interesting thing. There wouldn't be anything in the AQB criteria that would preclude somebody from doing that as long as they met the minimum qualifications. And if you're already certified, uh, those prerequisites, if you're already certified, then you've met those prerequisites. But w one of the things that we've heard um, very very prominently from states is when they when when they receive complaints against appraisers and they review and investigate those complaints and render a disciplinary sanction many times they feel that the reason those sanctions occurred was due to inadequate supervision when somebody got their uh, got their experience and applied for a license and so mark we've heard quite uh, quite loudly from some of these states that they think they that if this gets adopted they might use Perea as a remedial tool isn't that right that's that's correct and uh you know it's uh we have heard this this from from various states that that the a complaint comes they they bring the the trainee before the board the trainee has has a minimal amount of experience uh and they begin to ask that appraiser questions and again, it seems to come back to a lack of adequate supervision during the, the training process. Perhaps they, you know, it, it's hard to unlearn bad, bad teaching. And some of our supervisors are absolutely terrific in providing great training. And when that works, it's, it's, it works very well. But when uh, less than adequate training is, is given, it's hard to undo that training. And the, the regulators have, have discussed with us, perhaps this could be used for uh, corrective actions to fill in some gaps and, uh, and supplement even a, an, ex an, a, an existing apprenticeship model. Right, right. And so the, um, uh, we, we have a couple of questions um, relating to kind of a similar take about would would a, an appraiser be able to take Perea to satisfy continuing education requirements? And again, I'll go back and, and say that, you know, Perea is not education. Um, if someone did go through Perea and completed it and got a certificate of completion, uh, that is intended to be experienced. Whether a state would accept that as continuing education, I can't say, but uh, Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that's, that's a terrific point and one that uh, we would certainly need to, to explore. But uh, again, you know, getting back to your point, John, this is not intended to be education. It's intended to be experience. Right. Um, there, are, uh, there are a few more questions here I'm trying to scroll, scroll through and want to try to get them. One of the questions uh, has been posed about the potential cost of uh, developing a Perea program and and that is uh, that is a, a a big question mark at this point we are doing some initial um, investigation into that and, and again it, it 
we, we are still trying to make sure we learn and know um, what we know and what we don't know. Uh, it's not going to be cheap, uh, but the, if the appraisal foundation does develop a model program, it won't be to recoup the costs uh, in a year. In other words, uh, it doesn't make any sense to, to come out with Perea and then charge people $25,000 a piece to take it. Uh, that would be highly unsuccessful. And, and so therefore, if the foundation did, does develop one, we would probably be uh, looking at a long term to recapture the cost because it will be rather expensive to do. Um, there are some questions about um, if someone start, wanted to get their licensed residential credential now and then use Perea to, uh, it says to complete it, but I, I assume uh, that means to maybe move to the certified residential um, or to maybe start the education process now and then complete it once Perea is available. Mark, there wouldn't be anything, anything prohibiting somebody from doing that, but again, Perea is not formally adopted yet, and the, um, the, the question of, of how soon it'll be available still remains an issue, right? That's, and that's correct. It still remains an issue of how long it's going to take us to, to work through our exposure drafts. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be a, a state issue on how much of experience is actually going to be credited uh, towards your credential. So you would still need to be in contact very closely with your, with your state. Great. We've got another question, and the AQB talked about this uh, informally. I, I'm not. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't appear in the uh, exposure draft because it would really be part of the model program uh, if developed. But the question is: Will the mentors be required to take the Perea training themselves? And um, I, I think kind of the common sense answer is is yes. We probably would would require that because it would be hard for somebody to mentor. Uh, a participant, a Perea participant, if they don't know what's in the program. Uh, Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, my, my thought is, is that they would at least need to be familiar with the what is required in the program and the process uh, that the participants are going through in order to be able to mentor that, that individual through the program. So uh, at a minimum, they're going to have to have some kind of familiarity. Right. Um, we've received another question that, that asks about the feedback. It, what kind of feedback have we received from the states uh, regarding not, have, not requiring a log? And it's not asked there, but also throw out uh, not having sample uh, appraisals for them to review. And, and Mark, you alluded to this earlier that the feed, it's been kind of across the board, but uh, you got a, a thought you want to share on that? Sure. Uh we have had discussions with, with regulators on would they just simply accept the, the completion certificate as evidence of completing uh, the, the experience portion of the credential. Uh, and we've gotten responses from across the board of yes, we'll just take, we would, we would anticipate accepting the certificate as the only evidence to others that said they would want to they would want to do a second review on the USPAP compliant appraisal reports. So uh, I think until we, till they actually see a model program, uh, the regulators are still a little apprehensive of what they're going to require for on a state level. Great, and we've got time for uh, basically uh, one, more, one or two more questions. Uh, one says, would somebody be able to access and take part of a module to gain competency and I, I wouldn't use that word competency, but, uh, but to gain additional experience in appraising a specific type of property like a condo or, or something. And, um, and, and again, I'll let, I'll let Mark address this, but, but if, if you do part of it, you're not gonna get any credit. If you wanna do it for your own, at your own edification, your own knowledge or whatever, you can do that. It's going to cost you some money, and but it'll be just for yourself for uh, for uh, self fulfillment purposes. But Mark, do you want to uh, take a stab at that one? Uh, sure, I'll take a, a little little stab at it. Uh, you know, we're we're a little early in the process to to answer that type of question. 
but uh, the the proposal right now that is being exposed is that this is an all or nothing. So you would in, enroll, and in order to get a certificate, you would have to actually complete the program. Uh, now, whether or not that program can be parceled out into different sections uh, for uh, for refresher, if nothing else, to an, to an existing certified or licensed appraiser, I don't know that right now. Right. Um, another question says, would AQB approve the mentor and monitor their continuing eligibility, or would that be the responsibility of the PREA provider? And, um, and, and, and I'll touch on this first, and, and Mark can jump in here, but um, you know, clearly the, the mentor for the, the, for the entity that's providing the PREA training, the mentor would have to meet the minimum qualifications that the AQB establishes. But there would also need to be um, uh, measures in place to make sure that that mentor is performing properly, is properly guiding the participants. And, uh, and if they don't, there would have to be some sort of processes put in place that would uh, not only be able to verify that, but also to make that person uh, ineligible if in fact they aren't providing things right. I mean, Mark, you want to add on to that? Sure. There's a, I mean, we have, we have a corollary programs to this right now for, for certified USPAP instructors that we monitor whether or not they are uh, complying with what we need them to do. And I would anticipate some type of, of, of same uh, monitoring and oversight uh, would, would apply in to a mentor in a career program. Right. Uh, last question we'll take here. There's a, uh, and it's a good one too. It's uh, will Perea address uh, training in the area of eminent domain? Um, and 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 what uh, I'll say here is that you know the Perea training at this point is designed to be, uh, lack of a better word, generic. Whether there would be things specific on eminent domain or other specialty areas of appraisal, that might be something that somehow, somewhere down the line, could be added. But we're not looking at, at necessarily specific areas of practice, right, Mark? That's that's correct. And and eminent domain is kind of a niche in the appraisal profession, uh, and likely is part of that competence that would be required or that would be obtained uh, over time after credentialing. Right. Great. Well, with that, um, we are going to end today's webinar. Uh, Magdalene has posted again in the links to uh, the links here, what our contact information is there as well. Um, thank you all for participating, and we hope that uh, you can show up uh, either in person or via live stream at the November 1st public meeting. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I was glad to do it.